Good evening. As we uh, come together for just the sweet service of communion or the Lord's table, excited to be with you. And I'm so thankful for the way in which our, our music team, our music ministry, uh, labors to prepare our hearts for the services and the, the teaching that we'll receive. I mean, just that last song, uh, thinking through what it means that the communion is, is a symbol of us being invited to participate around the table of the king. Uh, I wonder sometimes if we really fully uh, recognize the weight of, of what it is that we've been given. To be invited to partake around the table of the king. <clears throat> we would never turn down an invitation of such status uh, and stature in the normal day-to-day -day part of our life. If someone of great uh, dignitary or someone of great stature were to send us an invitation to join in that, we would do all that we could to be there to participate. And yet, communion is that very uh, reality that we get to experience. It's an evening of remembrance and celebration. And this evening, I, I want to build it out of this morning's message. Uh, I have had a heavy heart uh, this whole week uh, going through uh, what it means to follow after Jesus and uh, each time that we partake of communion, my desire is to teach a message uh, dealing with either the cross, which we are called to be in remembrance of. Think again, the, the broken body and the shed blood, uh, which we know that was accomplished at the cross. Uh, or possibly the examination of self as a necessity of communion. First Corinthians 11, Paul gives this to the church in Corinth. Or both, uh, oftentimes. And so if you would, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3 this, this evening. We have been, I have been in Philippians chapter 3 uh, for my own personal study. And these passages just stood out to me, especially in light of the preparation for this morning's message. Uh, these passages, the, the richness that they hold for us in understanding the worth of our Savior. The worth of our Savior is a significant aspect of everything that we are. We saw that from our study this morning, and I believe as we are called to in remembrance, consider his work for us upon the cross. Uh, it's important that we see the work of the cross rightly in our lives. In Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to read the first 11 verses just to give us a little context. We're going to be focusing on verses 7 and 8 for our time this evening. But let's read together Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Finally, my brethren... Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even the flesh, even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in their flesh, I far more circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of the sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. It's an amazing text where Paul, in writing to the believers in Philippi, remember this is an epistle written to the church that is there, and what we see in this text is Paul reminding them of their salvation found in Christ Jesus. Reminding them not just for the sake of having a wonderful service together, but reminding them so that through this tru truth, it would bring rejoicing in it. Verse 1, that they would rejoice in the Lord. And number 2, to be on guard against falsehood, as seen in verse 2. 
And it's amazing because as Paul calls them to this, he, he's not afraid to use his own life to bring this to bear on their life. And of all the things that he would use to describe it, it's an amazing picture. He uses the descriptive terms in this text of a transaction of all things. It's banker terminology that we see Paul using in this beginning of Philippians chapter 3, describing a transaction whereby that which he had gained in his own life, that which he had pursued and laid up, he has instead traded or given in, considered it as nothing for the surpassing greatness of what has been given him in Christ Jesus. Now, at first hearing that terminology, it may seem strange to our ears to hear that what we often refer to uh, as being free, and rightly so, in recognizing that we have nothing to offer for it, why would Paul describe salvation in terms of a transaction? Well, I would say to you that honestly, this is not strange or no, nor unusual language at all for the pages of Scripture. Scripture often regards our salvation as an exchange. Jesus says in Matthew 16, whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for his sake shall find it. And what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world, but forfeits his own soul? In other words, consider it in this view. This is what I want us to call our hearts to understand the worth of Christ as it pertains to our salvation. We give nothing for it. But as we saw this morning, we do give up all things because of it. This is where the struggle comes in with those who would confront Romans chapter 4 and lay it against James chapter 2 and say that there's a contradiction. There is no contradiction. There's the simple reality of the freeness of our salvation granted us in Christ. But the outcome is that burden which though easy and that yoke which though light still truly exists. The responsibility of the gospel in the life of the one who has received it. We give nothing for it. We have nothing we can bring to the table that would measure up to receive our salvation as a wage or that which we have earned. But we do give up all things because of it, for it alone is worthy. Look with me back at Luke chapter 14. This text, again, is an instrumental text in my own heart. It's one that I continually go to. In Luke 14, we see Christ dealing again with the large crowds. And we looked at this text this morning. We're going to briefly look at it again this evening, and what I want us to understand is that when we see rightly the worth of Christ, this transaction that it calls for in our own life is an easy one. It's a no-brainer, so to speak. It's the offering of the riches of heaven for the forsaking of the poverty of this world and our own spiritual bankruptcy. It's a beautiful and amazing picture. It's one that requires no thought process whatsoever when rightly understood and seen. And Paul is calling to remembrance. Now, Jesus, in confronting the crowds, calls them to recognize the cost of being his follower. Listen to verse 25 to 27 of Luke 14. Now, large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. These are hard words that confront us in our view of who Christ is. But what I want us to recognize from this is it's confronting us with what is the worth of Christ. In other words, what is it in your life that is of greater value than Jesus Christ? What is it in your life that you are pursuing after that you have put ahead of Jesus Christ? If you can answer that question, then you've identified idolatry, and you can be about the business of putting that to death. What Christ is dealing with here is, as we saw this morning, he's simply saying, if you count anything as more valuable than me, it's not that, hey, you have to love me, although there is that measure, but one who has truly met Christ as their Savior will love him, and the natural outflow of that love will be of greater value than anything else in your life. It's the simple transaction that's accomplished through our salvation. One who is his cannot love anything more than him. It is not possible 
for you to have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father. It is not possible for you to see that He bore your sins upon the cross, taking the wrath, the condemnation, the punishment, the justice that you so richly deserved, that in the midst of all of that, He was stricken, smitten, and afflicted on your behalf, on my behalf. And then through the lens of that recognition, to love anything more than Him is in fact an impossibility. That's the simplicity of what's being displayed here. The worth of Jesus Christ. These are hard words. But it is good for us to recognize this because I would say to you that everything else will fail you. His worth is not simply that which we recognize. It's also that in reality. It's not like the shifting real estate market and other things that can be one thing one month and something else the next. It's not like the economies and things that we face. It's not like the price of gold that goes up and down or the stock market or other things that we put our confidence and wealth and value in. When it is in Christ, it is on the solid, steadfast rock that will not, cannot fail. Everything else is temporary. Therefore, everything else will fail when it comes to the eternal reality of our soul condition, which is the greatest thing that we have because it is the only eternal thing that we have. The riches, the treasures, the family, the body, the physical health, all of the things that we experience in this life are called in Scripture a vapor. Our strength is fleeting. Our life and the lives of those we love is but a vapor. Our wealth is temporary and our pleasures are distant. And in all of that, Christ says, but come to me and in me you will find that which is eternal. The forgiveness of sins, the salvation of your souls. Yes, even eternal life. And so when we consider the trueness of what we have in Christ, everything else will Be dim in light of it. And we should truly count the cost of Christ. We cannot earn it, but this is important. Because of that, because he gives it freely, do not let that reality negate the worth of grace. I think that's what we sometimes struggle with. Because it is a free gift, because we cannot earn it, because we do not deserve it, At times, I think in distance from being reminded of the cost upon the cross, we can begin to negate the worth of grace. We cheapen it, as we saw this morning, where uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer spoke in terms of what is cheap grace from his book entitled The Cost of Discipleship. We cannot earn it. He gives it freely. But do not let that negate the worth or the value of it. And Jesus in Luke 14 continues using an illustration or an example for us to consider as we evaluate our view of Jesus prior to our conversion. This is important, and I want us to see the distinction. In verses 28 down to 30, he gives two examples. We'll just look at this one. He says, For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is unable or not able to finish All who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. There's a measure whereby I believe oftentimes as we're on this side of the cross looking to it in our unconverted state, when sharing the gospel with an unbeliever, and we thought this morning we considered how it is that 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 can be ripped from them in, in the consideration of all that they consider valuable in this world. They can look almost with fear towards the cross of Christ and what it may take from them. And the recognition or the reality of that is they're not seeing the worth of what Christ is offering. We're given in true conversion, there's a a, a rebirth or a new birth that is accomplished. And yet we look, oftentimes have looked, I know in my life, I looked at the cross of Christ and thought, if this is real, what will it cost me? When I was converted, it was through recognizing what it cost him. It was realizing the worth and the fullness of who he is. And so when we experience that, looking back upon the cross, then out of that overflow is the picture that we're given here. There is no measure whereby anyone who has received the salvation of the cross 
would ever look back upon that which they have forsaken. I know in my life, we're told in Scripture, and I know this to be true, that the things that I once loved, I'm now ashamed of. Because of the cross of Christ, the, the things that I once did and pursued and loved are now a shame in my life. I, I don't even like to discuss them. It's, it's a difficulty of, of looking back and thinking, how could I have considered those as valuable as Eric prayed tonight, Lord, recognizing that the pursuits of this world are sand in the mouth of those who pursue them. So true conversion results in a, a rebirth or a new birth. A new beginning. And we start again this life with an eye that is now focused on heavenly realities. We discern spiritual truth. Hebrews 11 and verse 16 describes this life in this way. Speaking of those who live according to their faith, that but as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That's the result of the transaction that this world, which is all that we know in our flesh, is traded for that world, which is eternal and promised to us in our spirit. A heart which belongs to Christ, for he has purchased it. And this will and does cost us in the here and now. There is transaction language all over the pages of Scripture. That we are those who do not look back. We're told in that passage in Hebrews that those, if they looked back, could have returned to the country they had left. But as it is, they don't look back, but rather desire a better country. And God is not ashamed. One thing that you would have to consider from this is you do not want to stand before the Lord and find where he says, you are ashamed of me and know that I, therefore, am ashamed of you. That is not a place that you want to. And so this evening, this time together is for a realignment, a recognition of the value, the worth of Christ. That we cannot be caught up in the glitter of this life and this world. But that we can see it as what it is. It's the journey that we go through to get to the next. And so what we see in in, in Philippians chapter 3, turn back to that. Paul sums it up for us in verse 7. Describing his own conversion, describing the cost in this way. And in the verses before that, he laid out his pedigree. He said, all these things I have accomplished or have been accomplished for me. That I was circumcised on this day of the tribe of Benjamin as a Pharisee. I was among all Pharisees that pertained to all of these things I had achieved or accomplished the highest level. And then he says this in verse 7, but whatever things were, meaning past tense gained to me, Those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. You know the account from Saul unto Paul. The account of the conversion whereby Christ saved Saul's life. And his whole outlook on life was changed. Everything was changed in an instant. He was heading this direction, muttering threats against the church and hating Christ Jesus. And on the road to Damascus, the Lord Christ met him and forever turned him the other direction. This is the transaction where you turn loose of all hope and pride in our own flesh. Any hope in this world and what it can offer you. As Paul said, look at my pedigree and all that I had lived my life for prior to. I had accomplished so much. I had built these things but they are as nothing compared. I give them all up for the sake of Christ. And so what we see in this is this transaction, you turn loose of any hope, of any building. And in the midst of that, you receive or recognize the righteousness of Christ imparted or given to you as a gift. You were born again through the Spirit to a new hope, a living hope, an eternal hope. And your life can't help but reflect that. You see, this is what I want us to understand. So many times, there's this seeming reality where we don't take the tension of Scripture and live well in it. And we come to these passages that are commanding us to do, to live, to pursue, to labor. And we struggle with that because of the freeness of grace. And what I want us to understand is very simply, one results in the other. One results in the other. There's no getting around it. That's what Paul says. He says, I began in this way and I was good at it. 
I pursued this world, this life, and the things of it, and I was excellent at that pursuit. But something happened to me. I met the risen Savior. And when I met Him, my life changed. Everything was different. And so what I want you to understand is you don't control the impact of the gospel. We want to think that we do. We want to, we want to hear messages like this and think, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to stop doing this and I'm going to start doing that. And I want you to understand if you go out apart from Christ, you are failing already. The picture that's given is not one of you pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. That's why this message is for communion. Because it's a recognition of what Christ has accomplished that we might see his worth and in gratitude and desire enjoy the transaction whereby we have traded this life for the hope of the next. You don't control that impact. In fact, you can no more lessen that than you can change the reality of what happens when you are impacted by something here. You simply respond to the impact. And so tonight, I want to bring us around to again realizing the impact of our salvation, the cross of Christ landing in your own life and forever changing you. You don't, you don't control that. But for many, on the pre-impact side of the gospel, they see it. They see it for what it is, and it scares them. They face it fearfully, as though Christ versus the world around them may give them the short end of the stick. If I pursue after Christ, I will have to give up X, Y, Z. And more than that, I will have to start doing A, B, and C. And what we have to understand is for we who have been saved, we know. We know there is no comparison. That he is the pearl of great price. That he is the treasure that is in the field. And we who have found it have no struggle with those things. And that's what I want to call to our remembrance tonight. If, if you don't yet recognize the worth of Christ, then communion is not yet for you. Communion is for those who have the impact of the cross in their life. They can truly, what do you have to remember apart from the worth of Christ upon the cross? If you have not recognized the worth of Christ upon the cross, if you still think this world has something to offer you more than Him, then what can you in remembrance partake tonight? You see, it's our very close reality, our intimate knowledge, relationship with Christ that we are called to remember. Listen to verse 8. Paul's response to the thought of, of something in Christ taking something of greater value verse 8 of philippians 3 says more than that i count all things everything to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing christ jesus my lord for whom i have suffered the loss of all things but it's no real loss because i count those things but rubbish that i may gain christ the first thing we see is paul's use of more than that this is a forceful emphasization of how crazy the thought is that something could be of greater value than Christ. That anything, a friendship, a family situation, a status or position at work or habit or hobby, that being a Christian will or may cost you one of these things is somehow not worth it. Paul gives heavy emphasization. More than that, he says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, what he's saying in that emphasization is this. I give it all. And more than that, know this. I've given it all, but I would give more. Because it is of surpassing value. That means when I look around me, everything that I see is surpassed by the value that I know to be in Christ. Nothing else even comes close. It is without compare, Paul says. And he says, just so you know... Remember his pedigree before. I am not one who is speaking without knowledge. For I have sought the world. I have accomplished the world. I have been at the pinnacle of all things in this world. My religious pedigree, my accomplishments in the pursuit of those things is without par according to the flesh. But I want you to know when I am reminded of Christ, when I think on Christ, I not only give it all, I would give more. 
I would give everything and, and even then some things I haven't even yet thought of because he is of surpassing value. Now, what is it specifically that he's describing? Because there is some confusion at times about what it is that we gain in this transaction. Many today expect there to be health and wealth through the transaction that Christ brings. Some expect simply a fixing of their life and a freedom then to fulfill their own pursuits as they desire. But Paul says, what is it that he gains? What is it that's of surpassing greatness? Knowing Christ. Knowing Christ. The word Paul uses for knowing is not a verb, but it's a form of the noun gnosis. From the verb gnosko, which means to know experientially by personal involvement. Oftentimes we'll see this translated into the intimate relationship of friends, family, or even marriage. This is the knowledge of Christ through the gospel and according to the cross. Consider how the New Testament often describes those who are saved by Christ or those who know him as those who know him. John 10 and verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. John 17 and verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. On the flip side, we can see an example from the Old Testament of Eli's sons, Phinehas and Hophni. We know all about Samuel, whom Hannah brought unto Eli, but we oftentimes disregard or don't know as much about his two original or true sons. Listen to how they're described in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 12. Now, the sons of Eli were worthless men. That's strong language. But he tells us why the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. We can see this context where the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew, would take this word gnosis and put it in place of the Hebrew word yada. This word often denoted an intimate knowledge or even a bond of love. And so what I want us to understand is what Paul's describing is this bond that we have to know Christ is to be intimately involved with him, to know him personally, to know him personally. As a matter of fact, one of the places you'll see this word used, uh, this term gnosis, translated in the Septuagint is in places where it describes the relationship between a husband and a wife. Genesis 4 and verse 1, the term Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore him Cain is the Hebrew word yada, which in the Septuagint, the Greek translation, they use this same word gnosis to describe it that Paul's using. In other words, we need to understand that the worth of Christ, the knowledge of Christ is far more than a mere intellectual knowledge. When we gather to remember the cross of Christ, We are not gathering to remember a historical event. This is not something that you can read on Wikipedia and be in remembrance of. This is for those who, like Paul, have an intimate knowledge of Christ because of what Christ has accomplished in the exchange he made on their behalf. F.B. Meyer, an English pastor and a friend and contemporary of D.L. Moody, writes this, listen, it's a lengthy quote, but we need to hear this. He says, we may know him personally, intimately, face to face. Christ does not live back in the centuries, nor amid the clouds of heaven. He is near us, he is with us, compassing our path and our lying down and acquainted with all of our ways. But we cannot know him in this mortal life except through the illumination and teaching of the Holy Spirit. And we can surely know Christ, not as a stranger, who turns in to visit for the night, or is the exalted king of men, there must be an inner knowledge as of those whom he counts his own familiar friends, whom he trusts with his secrets, who eat with him of his own bread. To know Christ in the storm of battle, to know him in the valley of shadow, to know him when the solar light radiates our faces, or when they are darkened with disappointment and sorrow, to know the sweetness of his dealing with bruised reeds and smoking flax, to know the tenderness of his sympathy and the strength of his right hand. All this involves many varieties of experience on our part, but each of them, like the facets of a diamond, will reflect the prismatic beauty of his glory from a new angle. 
That's what it is to know Christ. That is the true prize of all prizes. That is worth any cost. And that is what we are to celebrate and recognize in communion. Communion is remembrance of that transaction and the life of those who have experienced it. Whereby we saw his, his worth and recognized our own poverty. And in the midst of that, we received the lavishness of his grace. And he became poor that we might be those who are rich. We are commanded in communion to do so in remembrance of his broken body and his shed blood. What a glorious price we have been bought with. And what a glorious Savior we have been given. Be reminded tonight of the cross where Jesus paid it all. What love that he would give himself. What power that he displayed that my sin, not in part, but the whole, has been nailed to the cross and he remembers it no more. This is the worth the value of what we in Christ know about him. And as we're called to remember that tonight, in the same way that Paul says, I consider everything else as rubbish when I think on him. So too should we. Through that, we are also commanded to examine ourselves in light of this conversion and to rectify by repenting from the sin which can so easily entangle us weigh us down, and hinder our running the race that we have entered into at conversion. To lay aside those things by confessing them to Christ, turning from them as we prepare this evening for communion. Use this time to truly examine the daily reality of your life. To cut out anything not worthy of the cross that we are celebrating. We've looked before that so many times it seems as though we come together for communion and we examine, we, we find those areas, those shortcomings, those failings, those areas where our faith has been weakened by the grime of this world, by the struggles of our own flesh. And we find them and then we seem to lay those in the seat next to us and then we, in remembrance of the cross, partake of communion. I would say to you that the way in which we are called to take communion is that we would examine and find the sin which does so easily beset us. And then we would take the cross of Christ in remembrance and look at our sin through that lens. It will do work in your life. You cannot look at the nails driven into your Savior's hand as he nailed your sin to the cross and then clutch that sin to yourself, loving it and desiring it more than him. Would you do that tonight? As we pray together, Lord, we are thankful for the gift you give us of our salvation. Lord, we recognize, even though poorly and dimly, the great worth and value, the great cost by which you purchased a people for your own possession. Lord, we are thankful tonight as we gather as those people. Lord, the assembly, the ecclesia, Lord, your bride, that we can come together tonight and in unity and in recognition, Lord, throw aside those things which so easily entangle us by looking unto you, the author and finisher of our faith. And Lord, that we would do so through the work that communion accomplishes. Lord, I pray for any here tonight, for those who are here tonight, who do not know the fullness of your worth, who have received some measure of you, some measure of you that, that has never satisfied them. Lord, not the fullness of you. They're still torn between this life and this world and your own worth. Lord, I pray that you would overwhelm that even tonight, that you would open their heart and fill it with the fullness of who you are, that they might know you, not know about you, not know some things that you have said, but Lord, know you. And Lord, as we gather tonight, let us do so in remembrance and celebration of the price you paid so that we might know you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.